So I want to do thesis one in this video, and I, I mentioned at the end of the last video that I'd look up the, the publication date, and I remember that it was 2018. And like this is a, a renewal, or, uh, or the English version is from 2018, but is there earlier, an earlier uh, version of this in, in Spanish uh, from an earlier date? There's no indication in the front matter of the book. Uh, but my my intuition is based on what Dussel says throughout the book that these chapters were written uh, sometime between 2006 and 2008, and uh, just based on the political sort of situations that he refers to. So um, I think um, there might be things in this chapter that that I'll place it a little later. Um, but it, 2018 doesn't seem exactly the date it, where Dussel is writing from. Um, so, you know, I, I just uh, was thinking about that. I don't know. It might become relevant here as we get into things. But let's look at thesis one. Uh, the historic populism of yesterday and adequate categorization of a legitimate process, a legitimate process, as legitimate. The Latin American juncture between the so-called World Wars, 1914 to 1945, and blatantly since the economic crisis of 1929, produced a geopolitical change of great impact in Latin America. The British hegemony uh, 1818 to 1914 is challenged by the North American economic and military power, a power that would replace the United Kingdom from 1940 on as a hegemonic power. The world wars amounted with immense costs never seen before in world history to more than 40 million deaths for the sake of the capitalist hegemon. And okay, so, World War, uh, the world wars were wars amongst capitalist nation states uh, for the most part. Um, and and uh, what Dussel is pointing to here is that the, the British Empire collapsed uh, in the middle of World War II. Uh, the British Empire was unsustainable. They'd, they'd bankrupted themselves uh, fighting Germany and, um, and were not in a position, uh, even by the midpoint of the war, to maintain their empire. Uh, but the United States came in and um, provided lots of weapons and, um, and then uh, used the weapons manufacturer to get out of the uh, Great Depression, and the United States emerged as an economic powerhouse at the end of World War II, and essentially took over large components of the British Empire. Um, and, and kind of moved to this phase of neocolonialism. Okay, with more cultural elements rather than traditional colonial uh, military occupation and things like that. The so-called Latin American populism, whose classical epic must be situated since the Mexican Revolution in 1910, or since the popular elections movement led by H. Irigoyen in 1918 in Argentina, until the coup against J. Arbenz in 1954, a little more than 40 years. Okay, so 1910 to 1954. And Arbenz, this is, um, Arbenz was the first uh, democratically elected uh, leader in Latin America to be um, uh, taken out of power by the CIA. Oh, uh, the so-called Latin American populism, which was mistaken by a theoretical dogmatism for a, a European Bonapartism, is the result of this concrete geopolitical situation. 
Since the beginning of the so-called First World War, which was not world war given that a great part of Asia, Africa, and Latin America did not intervene, the domination by the center of the colonial or post-colonial periphery of Latin America had to diminish its exploitation since the center found itself engaged in a brutal battle for hegemony. This became the opportunity for the slow and frail origin and growth of a certain industrial bourgeoisie and of a working class which was the product of a nation and always dependent late coming industrial revolution in Latin America. In certain more urbanized countries in Latin America around Buenos Aires or Cordoba, San Paulo or Rio, uh, Mexico or Guadalajara, etc., industrial enterprises were born which produced goods that were difficult to import given the war among the northern countries. G. Vargas, El Cardenas, J. D. Perón, among others, were the leaders of these processes of social contract, social contract theory where a weak national bourgeoisie grew simultaneously to a working class and to the organization in Mexico, for example, of the peasants. Okay, so we have this burgeoning bourgeois culture, but it's coming late. It's coming in the early 20th century, uh, especially during World War I. General confederations of businessmen, of workers, and of peasants revealed the organized eruption of a new political, economic, social, and cultural constellation, which was named populism. Okay. And so he's saying that the term populism really comes out of this historical experience, uh, unlike what Wikipedia said about the populist party in the United States. Uh, he's thinking from Latin America, the Latin American perspective, it's really with this early 20th century uh, phenomenon, historical constellation. This categorization was not negative, rather it attempted to show the fact of a hegemonic political project. Uh, so the, the term populism was not used pejoratively, rather it attempted to show the fact of a actually hegemonic political project insofar as it met the requirements of the majority of the population, including the bourgeois industrial elite. With the support of a state that had relative autonomy from the dominant classes, this project affirmed a certain nationalism that protected the national market. This is when the bourgeoisie were relatively weak, uh, uh, much more, you know, less of a factor in Latin American countries than they came to be later in the century. Okay, and so the the government was able to control the bourgeoisie, to co control the peasants, and to control the working class, uh, but did so through a legitimate populism. Okay. <coughs> The weak nation capitalism had then certain protected limits with respect to the use of energy, hence the nationalization of oil, gas, mines, electricity, etc., and customs advantage within the national market. This was the stage of the greatest economic growth in Latin America in the 20th century. This was the stage of the greatest economic growth before capitalism actually got underway. It was also the era in which governments were effectively elected by the massive presence of the people in clean elections. Even the social bloc of the oppressed made itself present on the basis of a democratic stance, a phenomenon that would have no comparison in the whole of the 20th century, with the exception of the revolutionary processes which we will mention later. For this reason, names like El Cardenas or J.D. Perón although ambiguous, are difficult to erase from popular memory. This same phenomenon also was also happening in other regions of the world's periphery. Kemal Ataturk in Turkey, the nationalist movement Abdel Nasser in Egypt, the Congress Party in India, or the Sarkano Party in Indonesia showed analogous circumstances, and Sarkano is the key political figure that uh, Bevins discuss, discusses in the Jakarta method. And Sarkano um, 
the populist leader of Indonesia, was um, you know the key to method of the CIA, etc. Uh, so there's an interesting connection there. You just mentioned uh, to the Bevins book. Uh, 